and turn it over to the magnificent teacher, Joe Hirsch. Okay, thank you guys. Fasten your seat belts and let's take off in a fast lane here. Um, I want to start with a quote, an anonymous quote that sort of captures the whole uh, thesis of my talk and the book that I'm uh, referencing. And the quote is this, the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. And then another quote that goes with this is one I got from a, a psychology professor 25 years ago. And in class one day, she just out of the clear blue said this and it stuck with me. She said, life is a party and everyone has, on, has only one question of each person. And the question is, what gift do you bring to the party? So let me say that one more time because it's, it's a thread that goes through everything. The meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. Life is a party and everyone has only one question of you. What gift do you bring? Then from there, I want to do the first part is, is uh, I've kind of labeled it a, a world view discussion. And these are some world views from some famous people that all um, blend in and support the, uh, the, the main quote. And the first one is one from Carl Jung. Carl Jung died at age 86. And this quote was a, in a letter he wrote at age 83. And the quote is this. He says, to this day, God is the name by which I designate all things which cross my willful path violently and recklessly, all things which upset my subjective views, plans, and intentions, and change the course of my life for better or worse. And a little background on that quote is uh, one of my teachers is James Hollis, one of the top Jungian analysts in the, on the planet. And I used to attend his lectures at the Jung Center and he, when he was in here in Houston, did for about 15 years. And once a year in, in one of his 12 or 15 lectures for that year, he would find a place and he would quote this particular quote. And he never would say anything about it. He said, isn't, isn't more than say, isn't that interesting? So I heard it once a year for 15 years. And then when Harvey came and my home was flooded and my wife and I were being put in a kayak with our duffel bag possessions and being to be um, taken out of our home into a, to a, a shelter. Uh, the guy that was pulling the kayak pulled it to turn it around after my wife and I got in it she was sitting on I was in first she was sitting on me and holding our duffel bag 
and the kayak tumped over. I'm on top of her. We're both in Buffalo Bayou. <clears throat> and we came up laughing. And the guy that was running the kayak was horrified. He thought, oh, what have I done? These two 80-year-olds 80, 80 uh, dumped in the bayou. And all, all I want to say about that is at that moment, this quote was what was running through my mind. To this day, God is the name by which I designate all things which cross my willful path violently and recklessly, all things which upset my subjective views, plans, and intentions, and change the course of my life for better or worse. Another quote that has to do with a worldview, and your whole life experience is your worldview. And the one in charge of your worldview is your life experience and you. So this is a quote from St. John of the Cross. And he says, what is grace? I asked God. And God replied, all that happens. Then, <clears throat> There's a, a kind of theme that runs through this whole thing. This is a quote from a Brad Brown, who was a co-founder of a, a self-help community, More to Life. And his quote was, there is no event through which life itself is not trying to awaken you to your most authentic living and human self. That's a little bit heavy thing to sleep on. This is one of my favorite quotes from Byron Katie. And Byron Katie <clears throat> is a contemporary mystic and I've heard her speak twice at the uh, Unity Church, and she's the real deal. And this is what she teaches in a nutshell. She says, if I know in every cell of my body that everything is perfect, everything in me is perfect and everything outside of me is perfect. If I know that fully, then I am in heaven. Then she says, if I think anything needs to be different, then I'm in hell. And my take on that is heaven and hell is the same place and every person has a key to both places, has access. Then, <clears throat> um, Buddha in seven words his teaching is attachment is the source of all suffering and what I understand attachment to be in the Buddha tradition is anything I'm seeking anything I'm clinging to and anything I'm avoiding is an attachment and the source of all suffering. To be detached is to be non-grasping, non-seeking, non-avoiding. And then a, a final, final quote is, <clears throat> Not a final one. This is in the, in the vein of uh, worldview. Is one of Michael Singer's quotes. And I spent a week. Mary and I went to his place in Alachua, Florida, and spent a week with him. And he's the real deal. Another contemporary mystic. And this is his daily practice. He gets up every morning and says, universe, 
take your best shot. I can handle it. Then he says, if I cannot handle it, thank you, thank you, thank you for making me aware of something I am holding on to that I need to let go of, something I'm attached to. Thank you. So with those, let, let's, let me just stop. I wanna finish with two more quotes and get directly into the, the book. But any comments? Let's have a little little feedback on, on that series of quotes as a worldview. Anyone just raise your hand and you can. Yes, Michael. You're muted, Michael. Okay, that's better. <laughs> Yes, they definitely resonated uh, with me. I think that that each of us got to a point in our, our individual lives where we had to come to terms with who am I? What gift do I bring? What is my life all about? How can I make the world a better place? And uh, all of your quotes just were absolutely perfect and beautiful. And I really appreciated them. Thank you. Anyone else want to weigh in on, on where we're at right now? Yes, Richard. Yeah, I, I kind of resonated with the thought that attachment is the source of all suffering. In our, uh, when my I group was regularly meeting, we all came to the conclusion that it was expectations that was a, sor a particular source of suffering. But maybe expectations and attachment, uh, if they're not the same thing, they're related. Uh, and I've certainly found that in my life. Expectations uh, <laughs> can, can really uh, bite you. And I love the quotes, Joe. Keep going. Okay. okay. Um, yes. Uh, I also resonated. I, I thought it was, I thought the quotes were very interesting. Um, I mean, on a personal standpoint, uh, I, especially, I mean, that could be from my age point. Uh, I'm trying to find myself. I'm trying to figure out uh, what I can bring to the table for personal events, for uh, life in general. And uh, I mean, truth be told, when you said the quote for um, what is the, what can you bring to the party or, or what, what presents can you bring and or, or, or uh, what gifts, yeah. Yeah, what, what gifts can you bring? And all I could think about was your presence. Uh, okay, <laughs> that's, own. that's, <laughs> you got it. That's the whole deal. <laughs> then the, well, okay. So we can go to the, uh, I want to do two more quotes and then uh, we'll do a, a breakout exercise and then launch further into the material from there. And these two quotes, because the rest of the talk is about this particular book. Uh, and, and you don't have to take notes or anything, but this book uh, was gifted to me at a week long workshop by a person that I met there and I gifted that person with some Michael Singer uh, lectures. And she said, here, take this book. This is my book, you need to read it. And that was four years ago. And- Joe, can you hold it up again? It's called, it's called The Great <clears throat> Work of Your Life by Stephen Cope. Thank you. Even cope, and 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 these next two quotes are the very first two quotes that he launches on in the book. And when we come back from this exercise, we'll we'll pick up on the one other piece that the book revolves about. 
And the first two quotes he does uh, in, in the beginning of the, actually in the introduction of this, his work, the quote from Thomas Merton, who was the, uh, an enlightened Trappist monk who taught the other Trappist monks. He was their guide, their mentor. And uh, Dalai Lama said of Thomas Merton, that Thomas Merton was the best Buddhist he had ever encountered in his life who was not born into Buddhism. He was American Christian Catholic monk. And, <clears throat> and this is the quote from Thomas Merton. Every man has a vocation to be someone, but he must understand clearly that in order to fulfill this vocation, he can only be one person, himself. Another way to say that uh, quote that I like is, everyone is a failure at who they're supposed to be, period. You can only, Okay, another way of saying that quote is, um, it's better to be a failure at who you're born to be than to be a success at some, what someone, who someone else was supposed to be. And I like this particular quote to say in the first person, I have a vocation to be someone I must understand clearly that in order to fulfill this vocation, I can only be one person, me, who I was born to be. And the other quote that this particular book is uh, based on, foundational to the book, is a quote from the Gospel of Thomas. These were the in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Thomas was, uh, historians think he was contemporary with Jesus and he wrote down Jesus's teaching, uh, another enlightened wise man. And this quote from the Gospel of Thomas is, if you bring forth what is within you, it will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, it will destroy you. Find your gift and be saved. Failure to find your gift and you'll not have a life. Okay. With those two quotes, let's go. Bruce is going to put up our, our, uh, an exercise and we'll break out into uh, rooms of three, five minutes each, and uh, put up the quote, Bruce, and let me say a few words about it. And then we'll break, do the breakout for five minutes each, 15 minutes. So the exercise is going to be to ask yourself, the first three questions, am I living fully right now? Am I bringing forth everything I can bring forth? Am I living my life's calling, my gift? And on the second three questions, if the answer is no to any of the above, the, the just do the first question and the last question. The one in the middle is kind of a, uh, I, I wish I'd, I just realized it, it, it doesn't flow well. If the answer is no for me, what can I do about it? And it should be reversed. That should be the second question. What can I do about it? And the last question would be, do I have any control over how, how my life is happening. So with that, let's break out for 15 minutes. Uh, in our group, we were curious as, what do you see your mission 
And then uh, just for myself, I was wondering, how did, did you uh, handle these three, three questions uh, yourself? Is that something you could share? Uh, yeah, uh, yes, I can. Um, what it did for me, uh, again, I, I came across it. Well, let me just say what I, I said in our group. Uh, um, this book was, uh, had such a uh, beneficial effect in my life. I'd say about this book, I've read thousands of them. And if, if I could only have one book, it would be this book. And what this book did for me is it made me realize, I had to ask myself a question, what's my gift? And what I realized is, is uh, I'm a born uh, student and born teacher from a childhood. If I learn something, I'm, I'm teaching my brother and my sister, I'm, I'm, I'm just get excited. And if I read a book and I'm standing on a street corner waiting for a, bu a bus, whoever happens to be there is going to learn, I'm going to be telling them about what I'm learning in the book. So, and I was a guy at work <clears throat> that they would see me coming down the hall with a brown paper bag and everybody would run. They say, oh no, Joe's read another book and he's gonna try and give us one, um, get run. So, so, so that's been who I am. And what this book did for me was part of the, the if you read the book, the, the teaching is find your gift, name it, claim it and be it live it and that brought that sort of casual i just did that i couldn't not do it but i wasn't doing it deliberately and on purpose like i am now and it changed um you know to talk about boys to men i retired at 72 and i've been working with boys to men for nine years and all of a sudden that's gone to a whole new level for me teaching teenage boys how to find their gift, how to claim their gift, how to be their gift and give them the tools they need to um, be successful. So, so it's, I don't know what to say except that um, uh, in, the, in, in my boys to men work, I'm working, with, I've got it uh, figured out how to put it all together. So I'm teaching guys that want to be taught. Uh, I'm in mentor heaven. So is so anyone, is anyone else kind of feel that way that they're there? They, they have a, a very clear calling that they're presently engaged in regardless of, of your age. Um, so, uh, Ernie, tell us a little bit about what your calling is. Who? Ernie? My call, well, my calling, my calling is, 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 uh, as a teacher, uh, I've always been, I've always been a, a teacher in one form or another. And, uh, and so, um, uh, working with Joe and mentoring boys, uh, it's been an incredible experience. I, I've taught high school for 17 years. So I was with adolescent boys every day. I taught auto mechanics and, and I thoroughly enjoyed that. And, and, uh, I was, I've been working with boys to men for about, I don't know, six or seven years, but I never had the opportunity to actually mentor in the schools. And since I retired, uh, Joe and I, I've been mentoring with Joe. So it's been an incredible experience. Um, it's, it's an incredible because I, one of the realizations I had when I was teaching in high school was is that I had an opportunity to be able to see these boys and then see myself when I was that age and, and uh, brought back a lot of memories for me about the things that I went through when I was that age. And it's, and it's given me uh, the vision to be able to talk to these boys on, that, on those same terms, to be at their level uh, somewhat. Uh, uh, and, and be able to just share with them just real, uh, 
real feelings that I, to be able to tell them, I remember when I was your age and, and I was experiencing this, you know, when they bring up different things that they talk about. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Joe's been an, uh, Joe's an incredible teacher and, and uh, he's been my mentor through this. And, uh, you know, we're, we're voice to men is in Texas is, is growing and we've got a, a great opportunity next year. So anyway, I'm enjoying the heck out of it. Uh, I was telling okay. them Thanks, the, Ernie. my goal in life. Okay. I was going to say okay. thanks, Ernie. Let, let, let's go to Maury and, and get, get his input, and then and then uh, let's go back to Joe. Then. Well, I think uh, Easton has Pfizer has. Yeah, well, has, yeah has Easton has system. some. So Maury and Easton. So Maury first, and then East, and then Easy, and then we'll go back to Joe. Yeah, I, I see my my mission as being a, of service to the community. So uh, that feeds into mentoring for boys to men. It also feeds into uh, service to the poor. And my particular uh, specific mission is to uh, be a listener, be a mentor, and be <clears throat> in resource, provide resources to uh, to those in need and I, I'm, I'm complete wonderful so easy hey What's your thoughts? so i was lucky enough to hear from uh from ernest as well and uh he let me know about uh, his ultimate goal in life and how it's to skid 10 feet uh you know because a buffalo skids 10 feet when you hunt and so that's the ultimate <laughs> i thought that was great uh, and also hearing about uh, the boys to men was was very interesting, and, and it's good to know that there's going to continue to be constant opportunities uh, for both the students, uh, young people, as well as all of you to constantly uh, revise and improve yourselves. And uh, hearing uh, being something that I resonated with was uh, that I was told was. Of a reaction versus a response. Am I giving something that I can improve on myself? I know is am I reacting or am I responding? Uh, and are we living in a, dual, a dualistic or non-dualistic, uh, you know, standpoint? So. Thanks, Easy. That's that's, oh. that's really great. Okay, so, so let's get get on with the uh, other piece of what. Um, the foundation of this book and the ancient wisdom of <clears throat> the um, <clears throat> the Mahabharata Hindu scripture is one of two major epics of ancient India. And what's special about the Mahabharata is it's just, it's the longest poem ever written, 1.8 million words, 6,000 pages. <laughs> and <coughs> scholars have compared its importance to the world civilizations, to that of the Bible, Quran, works of Homer, Greek drama, and works of William Shakespeare. And 20 page chapter in this tome is a uh, called, the chapter is called the Bhagavad Gita. And that translates as the song of God, the song of the universe. And the Bhagavad Gita is the best known and most famous Hindu text. Muhammad Gandhi referred to the Gita as his primary spiritual dictionary. And it was first translated into English in 1785 by Charles Wilkins, who was a British explorer. So the Bhagavad Gita teaches four pillars of truth 
and it describes the path of action in in action in action or that translates into our terms as the path of being in doing another way of saying it would be the path of duality in the, the path of non-duality in duality so what is it really saying it's saying we've got two modes of functioning one is dualistic everyday world good bad right wrong and the other is being where everything is one and everything is perfect so the bhagavad gita is the path of being <coughs> what you're doing and there's no conflict you are one with yourself one with the universe and one so it's it's about how to be your gift and the four pillars in just very simple statement of of the teaching of the bhagavad gita is first pillar find your gift <clears throat> second pillar do it full out don't hold anything back go for it with all you got <coughs> third pillar let go of the fruits you do it because it's who you were born to be you don't do it for money you don't do it for power you don't do it for prestige you do it because it's who you are let go of the fruits and the fourth one is turn it over to the universe yeah. it's not you you're being your gift and the universe is taking care of everything else. That's it. So what, what the author of this book has done is taken those two quotes that we started with, Thomas Merton. I have a vocation to be someone and all I can do is be me who I was born to be. You already have everything you need within you. Morning. And and the gospel from the gospel of Thomas. If you bring forth what is within you, and I want to put in parentheses your gift, <laughs> it will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, it will destroy you. You will have lived your life and never been who you were born to be. That's a failure. So with these two teachings, or the, he blended those, and what he did was he 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 has a uh, in his book. What he did was he took a famous person in chapter one. He describes all of the, what we just talked about. I just talked about. In chapter two, he has three chapters on the look to your calling gift and he takes famous people that you we all know and and describes their life and shows how they were they lived their gift uh, their calling and then he takes an ordinary person like us that he knows very well a friend and uses their life to illustrate how they did or didn't become their find their gift and be it. And in the next three chapters, he does the three chapters on do it full out. It takes a famous person and then um, and then a friend who did or didn't do it and what their life looked like and then how it was in his life. And he did the same thing and let go of your fruits. Famous person, a friend and his own life. And in the final two chapters, he does turn it over to the universe <laughs> and he does Gandhi and another famous person and then an ordinary person 
and his own experience. And the net result of it, what's so brilliant about this book is after you read that, you get it, what the Bhagavad Gita. I had one person I, gave, I recommended the book to. He said, Joe, thank you. He said, I studied the Bhagavad Gita in the university and I thought I knew it. But after reading this book, now I know it. And I know, and, and what I know is I, I never did know it. And me personally, I'd read the Bhagavad Gita several times before I read this book. And what I got was I didn't really get it from reading it. I got it from him telling about his life, his experience, famous people's experience, and ordinary friends' experience. And if you read this book, part of my mission in life is to get as many people to read this book as I can, because I think the more people that read the book, the better the world is. It's going to get on you. Um, and with that, we have one more exercise. Oh, let me read. Let me read one, two paragraphs out of the book. This is on. This is how he he's talking about a. Uh, and some of those earlier quotes, everything, everything that happens is an opportunity for you to become more who you were born to be. The good stuff and the bad stuff, everything, there's no good or bad. And this is on the, uh, the chapter of um, one of the chapters. He, the famous person is Marion Woodman is a brilliant, let me read the two, two paragraphs. <clears throat> uh, Marion Woodman, she is one of the world's greatest Jungian analysts and teachers. She was squarely in the middle of a brilliant career when she was struck down with a virulent form of cancer. She had uterine cancer at age 64. She had written seven books, a world teacher, and she was told uh, she had stage four uterine cancer and would die soon and to get her life in order. So what did Marion do? So much for her gift that she was working on. What was her gift to be now? So Marion did the unusual. She decided to take cancer as, as her new gift. She walked the razor's edge. She did not declare war on it. She invited it in to see what she could make of it and to see what it would make of her. She opened to the possibility that this experience could transform her in beautiful, great ways. Marion lived with her husband of many years, Ross Woodman, a distinguished scholar and author, and Ross heroically took it on as well. They walked the razor's head together and discovered eventually the gift at the center of cancer. And, and the gift was stand, stand at the center and embrace death with your whole heart, then you will endure forever. Okay. She was 64 when she got that diagnosis. She died at 89, five weeks before she was to be 90. She wrote four more books and continued teaching with the author of this book who met her when she was diagnosed. And he, and he had a, a, a working relationship with her for the next 20 years. So, this is just one example of what, of one person who figured out how to be their gift. So the, 
the thing about um, the path <clears throat> of non-duality in duality is when you're being who you were born to be, you've got the whole universe supporting you and delivering and being your gift and uh, incredible things happen. So let's do the second exercise. So he, and then let me just say a few words about it. Marion got a, what, 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 uh, this is some of Brad, <clears throat> Brad Brown's teaching. So Marion Woodman got a life shock at age 64. You've got stage four uterine cancer and you're gonna die soon. And a life shock is an unwanted or unexpected moment in time offering an opportunity for personal awakening. So what did she do about it? And this is also a, a quote from Brad Brown. A miracle is nothing more and nothing less than a change in perception. So what's a change in perception like Marion Woodman did? She didn't say, why me? This is awful. I'm not ready to die. She said, hey, what is life? What is life teaching me in me having this experience? What can I learn? That's a miracle in Brad Brown's world. So let's do exercise two. Okay. Uh, and what it is, did you have it in the chat, Bruce? But it's, it's, to, it's a very simple thing is you take a life shock, you take a life shock that you've had in your life, something that was, you didn't like and, and wished you didn't have, and you say, you do three steps. You say, this event has no meaning other than the meaning I give it. And you list whatever meaning you give it. Then you go back to one and say, oh, that should say two, list the meaning. One is then you go back to one and you say, this event has no meaning other than the meaning I give it. And then the second step is to list the meanings you give it now. And you keep doing that until you attribute, there's no attachment to the, um, there's no attachment to the meaning. So, uh, we almost got it repaired, but uh, but anyway, that's the exercise, and it's an exercise in in uh, saying the event has no meaning other than meaning I give it. I give it a good meaning. I give it a bad meaning. So let's do that exercise uh, like we did before. Fifteen minutes. Well, <clears throat> well how? Uh, someone, someone uh, just asked me what my um, a life shock I had and how I dealt with it. And uh, some of the people that know me <clears throat> just just uh, stop listening if it's too much because I keep talking about Bulgaria. But my life shock, <laughs> biggest life shock I had that I remember <clears throat> and passed before my eyes when, when I die was when I was in my mid thirties in Bulgaria, my, my company had uh, sold our software <clears throat> to the uh, Bulgarian government and I was assigned to be the project manager to go to Bulgaria, train them on how it worked and solve all the problems. And when I 
first got that assignment, I actually experienced terror of, uh, how can I possibly do that? This is too big. What if, it, what if I go and take on the project and it's a failure and everybody laughs? And I actually broke out in hives, big red blotches on my face within minutes of finding out I was, uh, that was my job. And so I had a, uh, and all this fear of not being uh, able to do it. So that evening I had a come to Jesus experience with myself and said, okay, Joe, you don't have to do this. So you can say no. That's one possibility. The other possibility is go for it and uh, make it as good as you can make it. And if it's the worst failure in the world or the best success, who cares? I'm going to just make it as good as I can make it. And then uh, the, the other voice said, it might be, you might learn some, it's kind of adventure and it's all new. And I decided I was going to go for it. And I did, and I sort of put on blinders for 18 months. And, and I was in a, I had a little mantra, find a problem, fix a problem, let the chips fall where they may. I let go of the outcome. <laughs> and I did that for 16 months and I was the last person to know that the project was a bigger success than anybody could ever imagine. And, and the reason was I never looked up. I was always, what's next, what's next? I can make it as good as I can make it and it's gonna be whatever it is, I don't care. And in any event, that was a life-changing life shot for me. I'm wondering about the other folks. Any, any other of you have? Uh, uh, yeah. Ken. There we go. There's there's Ken. Go for it, Ken. Yeah, Joe. Thanks. I, you know, this to me, this is like mindfulness in action, and it's just a great way to be conscious and and you know notice our noticer, notice our observer, notice the chatter in our heads. I mean, um, and, and I twist it just a little bit. You know, the event, the meaning I give it, and then that question of hey, are there other possible meanings I could give that would serve me better? So Joe, yeah, you chose, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna launch and rather than launch into Bulgaria as opposed to bail from Bulgaria. But it could be it was cold this morning. What meaning do I give that? You know? Uh it could be it could, you know, there's some dishes to do in the you know, in the in the kitchen. You know, what meaning do I give that? You know, and so it could be, you know, I visited mom last night and her dementia seems even worse, you know. What meaning do I give that? So it's um, I, I just find this to be a wonderful mindfulness and action tool. And uh, thank you for it, Joe. Thanks for reminding me of it. I, I think you brought this to us before, but uh, it's really resonating with me again today. Thank you. Who else? We got time for one more. Uh, an event in your life where you you uh, reinterpreted it in a way that uh, served you. Should I, yes. should I say something? Well, uh, sure, go ahead, Easy. I think I uh, being placing myself here uh, uh, in in where I am currently in Portland. Uh, I was, I found myself in, in Corvallis, uh, in university for a couple of years, uh, at Oregon state. And I had found uh, that throughout it, I, I had not, I had not felt too keen, uh, and where my place had been. And so my change was coming back, uh, coming back home and being home and, um, being able to view that in different ways and, and seeing it not in a negative light, but rather in a positive light to be able to show that showcase that I'm, I'm choosing to the opportunity to improve myself so that I can go back and that I can continue to be a better student. Uh, and I, I think that, that being able to look, having a new tool to look back at and maybe the things that I thought were uh, con what I could have considered to be a negative in my life, but rather to, uh, to showcase that they are actually 
positives uh, and maybe things that I even consider to be something I shouldn't even look back at is I, I can now look and view and, and, and recycle that information and, and truly take it in. And I, I really appreciate that. So that, that's wonderful, Easy. I'm going to ask the group, how many of you have had a very negative experience in your life that turned out to be, in retrospect, sometime later, one of the best things that ever happened to you? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Pretty much about everybody, all right? <clears throat> so you never know. You never know. So, well, Joe, uh, you go ahead and wrap up, and then we'll check out. Well, <clears throat> I personally think the, the potency of that exercise is you're in charge of what you experience. It only has the meaning you give it. It doesn't have any other meaning. And it's also an exercise in attachment and uh, take, take Buddha's teaching for a test drive. Attachment is the source of all suffering. And I'm the one that's in charge of what I'm attached to or not attached to. And just knowing that and having some tools to uh, not circle the toilet bowl when you're in a, a, a life shock experience. And uh, if you really want to get it, uh, the great work of your life is the best it's in the chat of that wisdom I've ever run across and it's made a huge uh, positive effect in my life and a whole bunch of folks or most everybody I know that's uh, done a deep dive into the book and it's, it's very readable and okay well thank you Joe, thank fantastic you. all right thank you joe uh kudos kudos this is uh this has been a terrific uh terrific meeting um 